Hey team, welcome back to another great episode of the Intentional Agribusiness Leader Podcast. This is your host, Mark Jewell, and today I am joined by a great guest, Brandon Miners with Midwest Bioag. Brandon, welcome to the show, man. Hey, uh, thanks for having me, Mark. I'm pretty excited to be on the show today. Love having you here. We've had a great warm-up conversation, uh, almost too good. We almost ran out of time here. We had, we, had to, we had to make a show. So Brandon, talk to us a little bit. What does it mean for you to be intentional? Well, that's, that's a great question, Mark. That's something we didn't cover in the warm-up show. <laughs> um, so interestingly enough, I thought about this question quite a bit. So intentionality is actually something else to be you know, transparent. It's a, it's a struggle of mine. It has been for a long time. Like um, I was thinking about, okay, well, what does intentionality truly mean to, my, to me? And historically, I have struggled in just my daily activities of being intentional, and I didn't really realize it until I actually married a woman who might be the most intentional person I have ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. And so she started to teach me how small daily habits where you slow down and you have a focus on being intentional about the little things that you do eventually lead into big things. She always says, being faithful and little will lead to being faithful and much. And so everything from when you wake up every day, let's say you brush your teeth, where do you put your toothbrush? Do you just set it down or do you put it in the same spot every single day? Right. Yeah. And can you do the small things and be intentional about the small things so that eventually these habits form to become intentional about the big things that matter in your daily activities with your business and mm. being a leader. And so it's really been just in the last five years that I've slowly transitioned and started to learn really what intentionality truly means. And, yep. you know, ultimately it just, it, it leads to, I hate to say it, it's a more organized life. It just really is. And, you know, as a leader that allows you to just become, I, how do I say it? Um, better for your people right because if, if you're disorganized if you're not being intentional about your thoughts and your words and those kind of things things can start to fall away if that makes sense and yeah. yeah yeah absolutely man good really good answer and good job giving your wife credit because that matters too right and uh, <laughs> my, uh she's <laughs> she's good at what she does she really yeah. is i funny enough uh, our CEO, my boss, gosh, he, he, he jokes that, uh, he just hired my wife, like through proxy by hiring me. He's like, really, yeah. I just get her on a daily basis. It's just, you know, I, I pay you, but she's <laughs> the one working for us. <laughs> That's love. I love it. I love it. My, uh, my wife has a saying around here that says the queen keeps the standards. Right, uh -huh. Queen keeps yeah. the standard. So we have a similar conversation on the <laughs> on the regular in our house too. So you'll have to meet her at some point. But you know, the the, the one thing you really mentioned, I want to highlight to make sure that people get is this conversation around small daily habits. Uh, one yeah. thing that really changed my life, financially speaking, for that matter, uh, was um, you know, one of my coaches saying, and this might be in Proverbs. I have to I have to go look that up to verify this. But like, you know what? how you handle the little things, right. Is how God sees how you can handle the big things. That's where right? it comes from, Mark. I mean, that, it's, it is, it's scripture. I mean, that's, that's where, right. Ye who is faithful and little will be faithful in much. Yep. And, and that, and that's where the foundation of it comes from. Right. Yep. And I think about, you know, we talk about, so I, I coach high school baseball. Okay. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a varsity baseball coach and, and, um, trying to well fix a culture there um it's been just two years since i took over as a head coach and something i preach daily to to my kids is from the time you graduate high school to 40 years old um, each one of you are going to have daily choices to make and where you're at you know at 40 it's these small daily choices that ultimately are going to lead you down one path versus another path yeah. right and one might end up being a very successful business person and another person had started at the exact same point right graduating high school at the same degree could not be successful it might be you know might be homeless might I and mean, there's a lot of factors that come with that but 
two different paths and ultimately those paths come down to those small daily habits. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. It's such a, it's such a great lesson. And I think, you know, it's, it's challenging for so many to, to, to maintain that on their own, especially if it's not native, you know, I was not raised uh, as someone to, I was not taught that, that well as a child, right? This is something that's right. a, that, that I'm growing with as I study intentional leadership. One of the things that you learn is like, man, like what you do with the, like what you do with the little things really matters. It stacks and stacks and stacks over time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we actually have a, now a behavior tracker in our thrive today app. Um, nice. that people can download by the way, um, free plug. It's my podcast, but, <laughs> uh, we, we, we encourage, right. We, we talk about Kaizen, which means small, seemingly insignificant, never ending improvement. It's a manufacturing principle, breaking things down into small bite-sized pieces and then doing them consistently over time, half a, a half percent per day, a half per percent per week, 1% per day, 1% mm -hmm. per week, getting better, right. In a year's time, you're 52% better in any behavior that's significant. You know what it I'm saying? Is. But the, I want to I shift and talk culture because what I've found, and I want to know if you agree, what I've found is it's really challenging uh, to do this alone, right? And yeah. um, I've also found often that culture trumps willpower, right? And so if, if you want to shift something, if you want to be a more intentional leader, if you want to run a better organization, you want to have a better team, uh, but you go back into a culture that doesn't necessarily support the little steps that are um, that are needed to have a great performing team. Um, yeah. It can be very challenging. So, how important to you is culture? How do you go about you know creating that? I know that's a thing that you're very passionate about. So let's just talk a little bit about that. How do we create a culture within which people can feel empowered to thrive? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because. <sighs> Culture is a buzzword to me. Mm -hmm. it, it really is. I, I was thinking about this before coming on the podcast about how more and more businesses, especially in ag businesses, I hear it from just my interactions on, you know, I, I meet with a lot of high level uh, people throughout uh, this, you know, this, this industry. And it's become a word that is talked about a lot, but I, I question a lot of times if they, if they really understand a, what, what is a culture, like a, a good culture yeah. and B, if, if they really know how to implement it, because I think a lot of times I just think that it's positivity and, right. I, and if it's just positivity, I mean, that, that's to me, I, I think that's kind of selling that short um, culture to me is truly having a group of individuals that have genuinely strong relationships with each other. Mm -hmm. where there is trust and transparency built in and where those individuals know each other on a deeper level than just a, how do I say, just a per business professional level, right? So mm -hmm. there's, um, again, I, I, I use these terms a lot, trust and transparency. So, so trust mm -hmm. builds, or sorry, transparency builds trust, right? Mm -hmm. If, if we're transparent with our business, that starts to build trust with our individuals. But I look at it more as, are you transparent in who you are as an individual? Are you as a leader willing to share your weaknesses, your vulnerabilities with the people that you're leading? And so that they understand that you as an individual, um, you know, sharing the same struggles, I guess, as them. Mm -hmm. And from that standpoint, you start to build this relationship where, and really it comes down to it's relationships. Okay. Do you have strong relationships throughout your organization where you're going to have honesty and integrity happening every single day? Right. And then from there, does that lead to passionate people that care about their job every single day where they want to show up to work or when they wake up in the morning, they care enough about the people that they work with, the people that they work for, and the, the mission of the company to truly go into work positive, right? Like, so mm -hmm. positivity is part of a culture, but it's not like it starts with positivity and you start saying positive things and it's just going to lead to positivity. It's all these other factors that will lead to a positive culture, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A hundred percent makes sense. And I, and I completely agree. When you think about it, you said something that's really interesting. 
most people think about culture is just positivity. <laughs> we need to have right. a culture of, of positivity. And that's why, like, that's one of the, I mean, it's such a false answer. It's such a surface level answer. Like, sure. We all yeah. want to have a positive place to show up and, and work in, but the reality is like we work in agribusiness and sometimes <laughs> the market takes a, it goes down <laughs> yeah. like it has yeah. recently. Right. And so farmer sentiment is not as high and, 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 and they're stressed. Right. And then that, yeah. that, then whoever's going to the farm gate, your retail salesperson and, and other folks that are going into those conversations, like they're taking the brunt of that, you know, and somebody, who, and, and then that trickles up into organizations and then, and then people start getting a little bit dejected and down. And now I'm not trying to talk about, I'm not trying to paint a horrible picture, but when things cycle down, it's just harder mm -hmm. to be positive because we have to think about, okay, this is now, this is when culture gets built. Right. By the way, this is when culture gets built is when it's right. harder. And, and yeah. by the way, it, it also, it fully exposes what culture you have built. If your culture has been built on the, uh, on, on a bed, on anything other than bedrock. Yeah. If, if it's not built on, on, on high standards, and, uh, and policies that promote stewardship inside the organization and caring mm -hmm. for each other. And like you said, building relationships and mm -hmm. making this a place. My, the thing I, I'm known for saying is that uh, leaders have a moral obligation to create places within which people can thrive. Right. And if the, if the work has not been done, if that's been built upon sand, mm -hmm. when things get challenging, the foundation cracks mm -hmm. and everything starts to run. 100%. 100% correct. It's um, if, if all you do is talk about positivity and positive vibes and things like that, and every day you just, you know, people show up and it's just, you're saying the words and yeah. that's it. And there's nothing actually real about like that bedrock, that foundation, because the bedrock and the foundation, okay, life gets ugly, right? There are challenges every single day. Every single person that shows up to work has a challenging life of some sort. They might have somebody that is sick in their family. They might have got, gotten sleep the night before. They might be struggling with, it could be a, a range of things right in their life. And then even at work, they, there's going to be struggles. There's going to be disagreements. There's going to be uh, market uh, things that come into play. Like you talked about, you have the ups and downs of the agribusiness world, which is extremely stressful. You have uh, times of the year where you have uh, high levels of intense, you know, demanding hours, and then you have your lulls. And, and you can't expect that every person is going to have this positive vibe all the time going on because mm -hmm. there's just reality. So when it comes down to it, if you're not built on those foundations that you talked about, it's going to crumble. It, yeah. that, all that positivity can go away in one day just like that. And you're going to be left in shambles. Mm -hmm. But if you have that foundation, if you have those relationships, if you, if you're, if the people in your organization know that they can go to their leaders and be vulnerable and say, Hey, today I'm struggling with this. And they know that you're going to listen and you're going to care and you're going to bring them, uh, you know, sound advice or that there's, you're just going to be there for them. Mm -hmm. That's where they're not going to run. They're not going to chase something else. They're not going to, think that it's just built on a foo-foo positivity kind of vibe, right? And that, that's, that's where happiness comes in, right? Where they, they can be comfortable in themselves. Yep. hundred percent, man. I, and, 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 you know, a lot of people think maybe this whole culture talk is a buzzword. Maybe I just, uh, I don't have time to think, fix it <laughs> right now. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm just here to tell you those, those of you that are listening, I mean, we, we have a client who, I mean, a relatively small independent ag retailer who has grown their business significantly by focusing on culture in the last 24 months. They've been focusing on culture for five, five or six years, but the fruits of that labor have now started to pay off in the last 24 months. Get this. They have acquired over $40 million of business into their business, not through acquisition, 
but by people leaving their competition and wanting to go work for them because they mm-hmm. heard how good the culture is. That's the power. And this is, this is not a huge, this is like a hundred and something million dollar company. So this is not like a big billion dollar oper- operation. Like this is right. a company that's just, just decided to focus in, hone in on their culture, make investments in their people, do training mm-hmm. for their people, create mm-hmm. new policies and procedures that get rid of the old stuff that's not working, implement new stuff. Uh, they raised some salaries. I mean, they just did some things and that was just a, a, a small component of it, the salary piece. So it, it has massive, massive payoffs. But the the thing is, the, the reason that I believe this conversation right now around intention is so important to bring it back to the beginning is that intention or lack of intention <laughs> will, mm-hmm. will lead to a very sore culture. What, what we say around here is all the times in life I've become the most resentful of my people, my places, my things, my culture, etc., are because of the times in life that I've been the least intentional. Mm-hmm. Right. So we have, as leaders, we have to own it because that culture well, is a reflection of us. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, any, any good organization, in my opinion, uh, lives or dies on, on leadership, right? It, it falls on leadership. Anytime that you might have, uh, I want to say, um, it might be a sales staff or whatever, um, you know, if the new organization that isn't performing properly, a lot of, I guess, the, my experience in the past has been leadership will look to blame them. Why aren't they doing this? Like, um, you know, those kind of questions, right? Versus looking at themselves and saying, well, maybe maybe it's a reflection of our leadership, mm-hmm. right? What are we not doing as leaders to create a place where people can thrive? You said it earlier, bro, building a culture is building an environment for people to thrive mm-hmm. within themselves. Yep. And not every single person is the same. You can't put them in a box, right? But there are things that you can do. The one thing that is similar to all people is, in my book, it's relationship, right? It is that that it's really that is the core of what I try to teach each and every day, or try to build within our organization as strong, trusting relationships of honesty and integrity, where people desire to work for you and work at your organization. You you kind of mentioned, um, you know people wanting to come to work for you. I, I said when I came into this role with Midwestern BioAg that I want Midwestern BioAg to be a destination place to work. Mm. That's what I want. Come on, man. And, and, and that only starts when you have people within your organization that I guess are living out daily everything that we just talked about where they, they love their job, they're passionate about it, they are part of the culture and People see it, they hear about it, they start to recognize it. And I'll, I'll just be honest, in, you, t- you said within two years, I've been at Midwestern BioLeg since November of last year, okay? In just that time, we have started to see some pretty, pretty phenomenal changes within our culture already. And we've had some just, I, I'll say some of the highest quality individuals in agribusiness come into our organization because They've heard about the change. They've seen it and those kind of things. And so I know it works. I know it, it does. It absolutely does. Uh, Brandon, talk to us a little bit about your, your, your background, what you're doing now, because it's super fascinating to me. So you've grown up literally in, in this ag retail space. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you know that space very well, have now run an independent business in that space and now have joined forces with, with Mid- Midwestern BioAg. So just talk a little bit about that and anything that we should know about either of those organizations. Yeah, so a so little background. My, my father um, started an ag business back in the 80s, uh, working on equipment, uh, installing TMR mixers, silo loaders, all, all the things, uh, you know, equipment based. But then in the early 90s, he got into agronomy and uh, teaching uh, soil health, soil biology, uh, cover cropping. He was actually one of the first people to uh, help the NRCS build a cover crop manual back in the early 90s, interesting enough. And uh, so I, I kind of grew up, you know, obviously, watching my dad run this independent business. And at that time it was, it was thriving business. I mean, he had multiple employees. It was growing rapidly. Unfortunately, later on in the late two or late, late nineties, you know, the equipment side kind of went away and uh, he went through some struggles uh, from that side, but I watched him transition that business from that to hundred percent agronomy. Hmm. And uh, as being one of the main uh, independent dealers for Midwestern Biolite. 
So I had this unique perspective of seeing Midwestern Biolog as a company work with their independent dealers and this culture that was built. It was interesting because we talked about culture, Mark, mm -hmm. as being part of like the employees that work for us. But in agribusiness, a lot of ag businesses are, they run through independent family owned businesses. And so this culture that was built was not just Midwestern BioAg and their employees, it was Midwestern BioAg and all the family owned businesses that were out here at the time. And they would bring them in, they would, they would educate them, they would have Christmas parties. They would, there was this, just a strong, almost tight knit, like family uh, aspect to it, right? Yep. And so, I saw that and, you know, unfortunately I saw it kind of also go away. What was unique is that because I had this, this perspective and I've seen when I was good, seen the kind of struggles that happened um, here recently, I was given the opportunity to come on a Midwestern BioLeg and do what we're talking about, which is to build a culture. Um, now, my title, Mark, is Director of Agronomy. I'll just say that that is not in, in, inducive of all the things that I do. Um, right. interesting enough, because I think I probably do more on the culture side than I do on the agronomy side. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, at the same time, I, I still run my family business in Southeastern Minnesota. Uh, it's called life cycle agronomy mm -hmm. and, um, I'm, I'm actually bringing family members on. I got, I hired my nephew here recently who cool. is now super passionate like I was, and he's kind of doing my day-to-day -day operations and trying to teach him about being a good leader in agribusiness. Wow. <laughs> so I'm, yeah. I'm doing it. I'm doing it with Midwestern Bioleg. I'm doing it with my family business and I do it coaching high school baseball. So love it. Wow. Good for you. So you, you've got a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> yeah. You've got a lot going on. Well, let's, let's, let's learn a little bit more about what makes Brandon tick. You know, what, sure. um, I'm just curious, you know, behind the scenes, what, uh, what, what is your, what is your personal study? How do you, you talked about, uh, off the camera, we talked about making investments in yourself and, and making sure that you get that started right every day. So what, what is the, what does that personal infusion into your life look like? Yeah. You, you know, okay. So when I, when I started this really got into it 15 years ago with my dad, it's, it's an ag business, you sell fertilizer, you teach soil health, things like that. But I got into it, Mark, because I saw an avenue to help facilitate change in our food system and to ultimately lead to healthier food and healthier human beings. I had learned at a young age the importance of taking care of yourself on a daily basis so that you, you know, you actually feel good. If, if, you, if you lose your health, you, you lose a, a huge aspect of life. In Absolutely. general, right? Absolutely. And I, I just seen that there was, well, food and my, this is my opinion. I know there'll be people that disagree with me, but I think food ultimately is, is the number one aspect to our health. Now exercise is right there with it, but yeah. ultimately food quality, nutrition, these kind of things are a big part of that. So, I agree. um, when I, you know, as I've been doing this job, I, I had to, interesting enough, I believed it, I was passionate about it, but at first I didn't actually live it. So what I've learned is that I have to actually live it because it, it's not just what I'm saying, it actually affects how I do my job, how I am a leader within this industry and how the ability for, you said I do a lot, right? Yes, I am. I'm putting long hours in. I am, you know, working two businesses. I'm coaching full time. These are a lot of things. I would not be able to do this if I wasn't intentional every single morning about getting up early, uh, making sure I spend time in the Word and in my spiritual side, and then also with my physical health. So exercising, doing sauna sessions, taking my vitamins every single day which my wife would probably, she's probably laughing listening to this right now. Cause she's like, yeah, right. Like if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be taking my vitamins every day. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's good. so there's that, but, um, it's, it's, it's that part of it, right? If, if, you know, uh, this is a common saying, you've heard it many a times, but early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy and wise. Mm -hmm. And when I first heard that, I was like, yeah, whatever. That's, that's probably true, whatever else. Now, it, as I've aged, I realize that that might be more true than almost any statement you could, you could, you could talk about with this. Cause if you get quality sleep, if you take the time to make sure that you're getting to bed at the right time, that you're waking up at the right time, that you're 
um, able to wake up and be intentional about yourself and take mm -hmm. care of yourself. Yep. Being intentional about the other things in your life will start to fall into play. If you wake up late and you don't have time to get yourself ready for your day and you don't and you don't have a focus on yourself, you jump right into the day. There is a it's very difficult to be able to be intentional about your daily tasks within your job, within like what you're doing as a leader. It, things become disorganized very rapidly. Right. Yeah. And yeah. not to be long winded, which I'm good at here, Mark, but <laughs> um all that will lead to poor health. Yeah. And if you're in poor health, I'll just be honest, you're, you're not going to be able to function at the, the capacity that you probably need to, to truly be a good leader within this industry. And not just this industry, this is, this goes across all industries, to be honest. Yeah. hundred percent. It's, it's, it's obviously across all industries and because we're on the front end of the whole food system, I would, I mean, one of my career goals is to have us as an industry start looking the part. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And I mean, and yeah. this is, we have so many people and guys, and I'm, I'm not just talking, you know, talking to everybody at this point, Brandon, like, <sighs> guys, we have, we have just, and Brandon and I are recording this on September 4th. Over the last 30 days, we've had over 115 people enter our thriving leader program. Uh, mm -hmm. where we talk about this. And one of the things that they do at the onset of that program is we put them into a workout. And so huh. often there are people who have never worked out and they're at a, all of a sudden find themselves at a kickboxing workout that they don't want to be at. And they're probably mad because their employer sent them <laughs> to this program. Right. Right. And I, but I, I tell them at that program, I said, I know that you probably didn't want to be here. Um, maybe your employer sent you. Um, you certainly didn't have getting up at 5.30 a.m. for a six o'clock workout on the, your list of things that you normally do because I know my audience and 90% are just not doing anything physically active, especially early in the morning. They're doing other things. They're rolling out of bed, getting it, you know, rolling right into email, rolling right into reactive mode, reacting to the customers, the family, the business, the markets, et cetera, et cetera. And so <clears throat> it goes against the grain of all those positive little habits that we talked about early on in the podcast yeah. today. But what, uh, what I say to him is like, I, I understand that you probably didn't, you probably had some choice words about me. <laughs> when when you were rolling out of bed at 5 30 in the morning and, and i said the reason we continue to do this and we've done this over 140 times now the reason we continue to do this is because i care more about the version of you that's now going to be showing up at home with your kids the version of you that's going to show up for your spouse the version of you that's going to have more capacity to lead your colleagues than what you think about me right you know, right. and we need more people to stand up inside organizations like yours and lead by example. So we mm -hmm. talked about early on, like just what, what is the culture of the place? If the culture of the place is unhealthy, then that mm -hmm. becomes the standard of what's okay. Right. By the way, not just physical health and spiritual health, relational health. Right. We, we found like corporate America has become a breeding ground for, for divorce and other mm -hmm. sorts of uh, mm -hmm. things that negatively impact relationships, even those that don't get divorced. And so, um, <clears throat> we, we, we need to raise up more organizations and really become the, the, the ministry and, and and do God's work through our organizations in ways that frankly, other parts of our country, government churches are failing. Yeah. There, I said yeah, it no, I, all the things I've been thinking. <laughs> no, I, I, honestly, you, you hit the nail on the head there, Mark. Um, for, first and foremost, you know, when I when I started this position with Midwestern Bioleg, Mark, I, I said, yeah, culture is ultimately what I'm what I'm trying to build here, and that's just kind of a broad term, but really, I want my employees to have this ultimate work life balance where they are at home with their kids at the right time where they, they have the ability to um, have strong marriages, strong relationships at home. We talked about relationships, right? And how important that is within the organization itself, but that is nothing and matters nothing if the home life is terrible. Mm -hmm. And if the, if the job itself 
is taking away from that home life. And now, yeah, there are times where we might have to work some longer hours and some sacrifices, but if we as leaders help to teach, to train, to help them help facilitate an understanding of, okay, when you have these long hours, let's make sure that we're balancing this out. You do take the time to be with your family, that you do take the time to build that relationship with your wife or your spouse. And so that that foundation is there, because if you lose that foundation at home, you're not going to be nothing at work either. And I mean, because the stresses at home carry into work and vice versa, both ways. Absolutely. Right. And so, again, you know, I, one thing I want to touch on when you were just talking is stress. Right. Mm -hmm. So interestingly enough, one of the one of the key things in agriculture right now that is another buzzword is like de-stress, de-stress the plants, de-stress corn, de-stress soybeans. There's a huge part of de-stressing the plant so that they can thrive. If yeah. it gets stressed, if ethylene production goes up, that plant is going to suffer. Well, guess what? We are just like plants, yep. right? If we get stressed, our ability to thrive goes down. Mm -hmm. If we don't get intentional about our daily choices and making sure we take that time, and it's not just leaders, it's everybody in the organization, but it starts with leadership, right? It always starts with leadership. And so if we can lead by example, be healthy individuals, show them what that means to be able to make those choices, and then encourage that through our organization, that is going to filter and it's going to, it's going to go from our business. Like you said, we can do the job that some of the churches should be doing or the government should be doing and things like that that are, are I hate to say it, but it's failing. Yeah. It's failing. 100%. So, and I, I believe this is the, the way of the future. This is why I'm so passionate about working with leaders, uh -huh. specifically leaders in agribusiness to, to, to equip them with the tools to lead with intention. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I love it, Mark, to be honest. I love it. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you. Talk to us a little bit. Actually, now, question I just wrote down, cause we want to go back a little bit. We were talking about like the, just the quite literally the schedule that you carry. And mm -hmm. we kind of got into this talk around capacity to do so. Talk to us a little bit about the how to, just generally speaking, how do you keep it all straight? <laughs> like, how do I keep my life straight? Yeah. How do you, so we, I mean, we're, we're full-time varsity baseball coach, right? Which has inside and yep. outside of the season ramifications in your life. You got a family. Yep. You've got, uh, you know, now you're, you know, leading agronomy at Midwestern BioEgg, plus you've yep. got another, another business. So that's four big yep. things, like yep. four big things plus branded. So that's five big things. <laughs> so how do you, how, yeah, how do you, how do you maintain just the structure around that? Cause I, I know somebody's you know, going to be listening to this thinking like, okay, well, how does he do it all? Like, how can he maintain all of that? Cause I, you're, you're the walking example from, from that hour that I've known you now, yeah. <laughs> the, the walking example of what I'd like to see more of, but it's like, well, people are going to say, well, how do you do it? That's a, honestly, that's a great question. It's a question that I ask myself sometimes and the people around me that uh, have known me for a long time ask me. And it, really the answer that I've come up with is it's, it's a couple of things. And it starts, number one, it starts with my, my relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Um, it, and I just, this is for, you know, again, people might disagree and might, I might not understand Mark, but that foundation of my faith is mm -hmm. where everything stems from. Like it's through that strength that allows me to do everything else. There is a passion for helping people that I, I want to say does not come from me. It comes from him. And so that there is like an energy and a passion to go and to do that, that, that obviously drives me every single day. But mm -hmm. if I don't balance it out, like you're kind of asking, um, obviously we talked about before this, I'm going to burn out and I, and I've done that before. So I, I, the one, the one unique thing is, is I've learned through experience what is going to happen if I don't get intentional and find ways to balance all of this. Mm -hmm. But to answer the question, it really comes down to surrounding myself with the right people, making sure that I am able to delegate tasks. Now, that is something that I'm not sure if you're going to ask me about later on, but it's a struggle of mine. So mm -hmm. being an independently owned uh, or owner of a business, 
where I didn't have employees. It was for a while, it was my dad and myself. And then it was me and then a part-time bookkeeper and whatever else. Like there was no delegating tasks. This was, it was all on me and I felt like I could do it all. And what I had was a very, very hard reality check where I realized I can't do it all on my own. And so I, I lean on my wife. Right. She is a big part of helping me to balance my schedule, to be intentional about taking time for myself Mm -hmm. Um, within my organization is making sure that I know how to properly delegate tasks to those people that are around me. Now, uh, I don't want to get too long winded on this, but this might be an opportunity, Mark, to talk about like there's a word that I'm using at BioAid called servanthood Mm -hmm. um, and understanding how to serve. Now, Mm -hmm. people think I think as leaders that those that report to you are there to serve you and what you want done. And I look at it kind of the opposite is I am there to serve first, right? And so there's that, but through that, I'm able to understand and how to properly delegate tasks to other people. So that allows me the freedom to be able to do more than what some people might, might not be able to do, right? Because if you take it all on yourself, you just can't. When, I, when I'm coaching baseball, I would not be able to coach baseball the way that I can right now if it wasn't for my assistant coaches, plain and simple. If I didn't have the quality of an assistant coach that I have, um, there's no way that I could do this as part of everything else that's going on, right? The moment that that person's removed, that relationship's gone or he's out of my organization, I honestly think that I'm going to have to give that part up. I have to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's not it's not about me and what I can do. It's more about those that are around me and how they're allowing me to be able to do all these kind of things. Does that make sense? It hundred percent does. A hundred percent does. In our executive coaching program, uh, we talk about there's there's three factors that an executive leader has to be able to have and develop over time in order to be effective. And one is the attractor factor, which is what we ta- we kind of covered that in mm-hmm. um, in our culture talk, where it's like, hey, we're, we're, we're focusing on the culture. We know who we are. We know who we're not. And we're attracting people because of it, right? Mm-hmm. And then there's something called the stabilizer factor, uh, which is where we put in structure, right? But then there's the multiplication factor, right? And multiplication only happens. Nothing in the kingdom is one plus one, right? Everything in the kingdom in God's math is multiply, right? Sure. One yep. acorn, one acorn becomes millions or billions of acorns yep. over, over a couple hundred years, right? So it's, yep. it's everything's multiplication. Uh, so in, in our way, well, how do we do that? We multiply through others, right. right? As a leader, your job, as an intentional leader, your job is to pour into those other people around you, right. And, you know, hey, maybe that um, assistant baseball coach doesn't feel they're ready for head coach yet. But boy, do they sure feel empowered because they have so much, there's so much trust in them. Yeah. Right? And maybe you're getting that person ready for, maybe they do go to another team, right? But now they, they're ready, right? Yeah. Now you've multiplied that culture across yeah. another generation of kids that are going to grow up underneath that person's tutelage. And so like, that's how we grow. Like it's, it's, there's often the difference with people. So, you know, we're not an oak tree. We can't, <laughs> you don't see the, 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 the fruit every year, right. but it just, the ripple effect is so much, there's such, such a greater magnitude to it. So those are the, those are the three factors. And we teach that in our executive coaching program. So, yeah. um, and it's, it's important and you have to be able to get to that multiplication. So what I'm hearing on the how to is double down on delegation, get more comfortable with that, develop your processes and systems, work through other people, coach other people, coach them up, pour into them. Oh, yeah. Right. So that we can multiply. Yeah. hundred percent, you know, um, investing into human capital, right. Human yep. capital, being willing to take the time to serve, to teach, to just to help an individual grow in whatever capacity is best for them too, right? Like I think a lot of times we 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 get into these boxes as coaches, leaders, as thinking that our way is the only way and that every single person underneath of us needs to just do what what we think is this one specific way to to be successful. That makes sense. Yep. In a reality, every individual is different. And so how you coach them needs to be different. 
And 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 some there's there's certain principles, Mark, that are gonna they're going to apply to everybody, right? But there are ways of coaching them or teaching them that might be different for each individual. From a coaching standpoint, the best coaches in sports are the ones that are willing to adapt and change their coaching uh, techniques mm-hmm. based off of the talent that they have, right? Yeah. And so if you are willing as a leader to, again, this goes back to, if you have the, uh, the relationship with your people, and you truly know them intricately about their lives and who they are, um, you're, that's when you're gonna be best to be able to be intentional about how you train and grow them in, within their role. If you don't have that relationship, if it's just a, you know what, this is who I am, do, do what I ask you to do today, um, here's, here's my method, and this is, this is what works because this always works, whatever else, then mm-hmm. you, you, you never actually grow within that relationship and truly know them intricately again it, right that's what it really comes down to yep beautiful man beautiful all right uh brandon we're just super out of time right now we could keep going so we will definitely uh i'm definitely putting your name high on the second interview list because we could <laughs> we've got we've got a yeah, lot in common I, and we can uh, we can go deeper on so many of these topics but any last thoughts that you would have for the audience before we uh, close her down Oh, that's one I didn't think about, Mark. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, um, let me say it this way. You know, we talked about a lot of good things. Let's close out with this. We talked about a lot of good things uh, in, the, in this podcast, a lot of stuff that we understand that we're doing right. What's the biggest thing that you need to improve on for yourself this year? I, I mean, honestly, so I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And we just talked about it. It, it. As much as I talked about being able to delegate tasks, it's also probably my weakest point. Yeah. So I have... I have been, obviously, I've been a coach for many years, by the way. So like, this is a new head coaching role, but I've been coaching and doing private lessons and things like that within the baseball and softball world for many years. Sure. Um, and I'm, I'm, it's, it's something that I'm skilled at from that standpoint, but getting into this new role of Midwestern Bioag, I had to learn how to, I guess, delegate differently than it is within coaching baseball. There is a difference yeah, there. Of course, of course. And so, um, Let's just say I brought some skill set in and it's worked, but it's I, I'm not as skilled at that as I want to be, right? I want to be able to give freedom to my employees, be able to delegate some tasks to them. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not a micromanager, right? I don't think I don't believe for one bit that micromanaging people works. I, I think yeah. um, you have to give freedom for them to use their skill sets and their talents. Uh, to their best abilities. And if you micromanage them, they're going to, you're going to limit that capacity. Um, but it's kind of learning what tasks and how to properly delegate to what, like, what person, who's the right person to give this one to so that they best thrive within their role, which is interesting because I think a lot of times, Mark, we think about delegating tasks is I need to get something off my plate, right? So let me just give it to this person or this person instead of thinking about, I have this task that I do need to get off my plate because I have other things I need to do, yep. but who is best going to thrive in doing this? Because mm-hmm. everybody has their different skill sets and their talent levels, right. and not every person is going to take that task and run with it the way that maybe you need them to, right? So I, that's that's really where I'm trying to grow the most. And, that, and again, that comes back to slowing down, thinking about the situation, being intentional. I mean, you use that word obviously a lot. And I, I'm trying to learn, that's a, you know, I've, something I'm trying to learn more about, which is, which is be intentional about who, who am I going to give this task to, right? And does it matter? It does matter who it, who it goes to and who's going to be able to thrive from it. So Absolutely. Good. Yeah. Well, then I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you, Brian or Brandon, to, uh, to go over, get the Thrive Today app. It is mm-hmm. a fully gamified experience. And so um, you can actually track the behavior of delegation under the leadership behavior. Awesome. So you, it's a daily tracker. Every time you delegate a task, you can go in there and, and, and log the behavior. And then uh, we, have, we have a leaderboard. So eventually you'll, you'll be able to see how you're tracking against other people in, nice. the, in the delegation category. So we get that competitive edge too. <laughs> nice. Nice. So, I, I, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, Looking forward man. to it, Mark, to be honest. Dude, thanks for being on here. Yeah. No, I, I, I really appreciate it. This is, you, you've given me an avenue to 
continue to do what I'm passionate about, Mark. You know, um, I've, I've known for a long time that I hate to say that the, this kind of role was coming uh, within like Midwestern Bioleg to lead and to, uh, well, yeah, just to be able to lead people. But uh, deep down, I, I spent a number of years, this is something we didn't talk about, but I spent a number of years seeking out leadership conferences, uh, reading books, you know, just trying to do everything I can to uh, refine my skills to become a great leader. And I did that because I experienced very poor leadership in the past and I knew how it affected people. And I don't want to affect people in that way. I want to, I want to, I know that I can help people live better lives. I know that I can give them better quality of work life balance. Um, and, and to build in relationships ultimately because, and I'll, I'll finish with this, Mark. Um, I can't remember exactly the study that was done. It was actually my assistant baseball coach who told me about it, but essentially they, they did a poll of, you know, those who were like the happiest in their late, late life. And, you know, they looked at, was it, was it possessions or what was it that brought happiness to them in their elder years, in their seventies and eighties and nineties. Yep. And ultimately what it came down to, it was the quality of the relationships around them that they had. It wasn't possessions. It wasn't money. It was those relationships built quality of life. Right. And ultimately we have an avenue to be able to do that through business um, and affect people positively. Come on, man. I love it. All right, Brandon, thanks for being on, dude. This is great. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mark. You take care.